Everyone is familiar with the basic idea of a jellyfish, but what do we mean when we use that term? The most commonly seen are things like sea nettles, which can bother swimmers and be stranded ashore as amorphous brown blobs. These are some members of the Cyphozoans. Their life cycles typically include a polyp stage attached to the bottom, which produces baby medusae. When conditions are right, these babies can grow up and form vast blooms of adult jellies. But for every moon jelly pulsing in coastal waters, there are deep sea relatives which defy generalization. They can be a meter across, 20 meters long, and lack tentacles. The branch of the tree of life called Cyphozoa also includes another lineage, the coronate medusae. Typically found in the deep sea, they can be brightly bioluminescent, and many lack a polyp stage in their life cycle. All of these Cyphozoans are cnidarians, the sea is silent, relatives of sea anemones and corals. This group is defined in part based on the presence of stinging cells. The most infamous stingers are the sometimes lethal box jellies found in tropical waters, but most cnidarians pose no danger to humans. Most species of swimming jellies are actually in another group called the hydromedusae. These are often small and transparent. They may have very few tentacles, or very many. They might or might not have a small polyp stage called a hydroid. One group of hydromedusae has tentacles which point ahead of them instead of trailing behind. These eat other gelatinous organisms, rather than the crustaceans favored by many other cnidarians. But even with all this diversity, we haven't yet encountered the most unusual hydrozoans. Would you consider a siphonophore a jellyfish? From the Portuguese man o war floating on the surface, to dozens of species found in the deep sea, these are among the strangest of marine animals. They have divided up the tasks of living among different subunits. Some parts pulse to move the animal through the water, but they can't feed. Others, connected by a thin tube that runs the length of the body, can feed or reproduce, but not swim. Although siphonophores can grow to be 30 meters long, the most common are small, rocket-shaped species found throughout the ocean. Those are the cnidarians, including some of the most familiar and unfamiliar animals that might be called jellyfish. They all have in common the presence of stinging cells called nidae. Not all jellies sting, though. Another deep branch in the tree of life leads to the tenophores, also known as comb jellies. Their defining trait is eight rows of ciliary plates, which flutter like eyelashes to move them through the water. Some species use sticky tentacles to capture prey, much like a spider web. Others lack tentacles, but use tooth-like cilia in their mouths to bite and swallow gelatinous prey. Many deep sea species of comb jellies are so fragile that they are new to science or have only been recently described since the advent of submersibles. Nearly all are bioluminescent and many have red or black pigmentation, which is thought to mask the luminescence of their ingested prey. The next group that is often lumped with jellyfish are the urochordates, including salps, doliolids, and larvations. These are the most vertebrate-like of invertebrates, with many traits shared with chordates. Salps are typically colonial, forming units that can be tens of meters long. Each unit within the colony pumps water through their body, filtering out phytoplankton and even smaller particles. Therefore, they are the only jellies that subsist directly on algae and microbes. Because they grow and reproduce rapidly, salps and doliolids can form dense blooms in many regions. Larvations filter particles using a mucus house that they secrete and inflate, sometimes many times a day. The mesh is so fine that they're able to retain and ingest even bacteria-sized particles. So the factors that lead to changes in salp populations and the effects that salps have on an ocean ecosystem are very different from the causes and effects of changes in cnidarian and tenophore populations. We know of slugs and snails that crawl along the ground, but a variety of mollusks live in the water column, flapping their feet to swim. Many have even retained their shells, although typically in a reduced form. Many kinds of worms also live a gelatinous life. This includes the polychaetes, which are distant relatives of earthworms. One of the most abundant deep sea animals below 2,500 meters is actually a polychaete with fans of long seedy, the bristles that characterize polychaetes. Other segmented worms, transparent and beautifully bioluminescent, lack these bristles entirely and swim around preying on gelatinous organisms. 
Some worms with two beady red eyes are parasites and predators on jellies. So is there really such thing as a jellyfish? Are they only circular cnidarians or also elongated ones? Do they sting people or eat microscopic plants? Are they rare and elusive or poised to take over the world? All across the tree of life, organisms have evolved jelly-like adaptations and each has its own way of thriving and surviving. Understanding their diversity is an important first step to understanding life in the largest habitat on Earth. This is Steve Haddock from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. If you see any jellyfish-like creatures, be sure to report them at jellywatch.org.